Hi, Chase Cunningham, Dr. Zero Trust. I'm going to run through some stuff that I think is a little bit groundbreaking uh, and interesting ideas in this space that we should look at. So bear with me because this is going to be a series of things, but it's super important that we understand this. I recently published a blog and some papers on uh, WAF needed to die and got lots of vitriol and honestly a whole lot of back sort of fodder about it, which is fine. That's what the internet's for, discussion. But I wanted to run through kind of the reality of what's going on there and then prove that there is a different way to do this that might be valuable for people to consider or don't that's just you know my opinion anyway so let's let's run through some popular implementations of apps and things like that that are notably vulnerable and while none of the stuff that i'm going to show you means it's an immediate you could hack this you could rip it to shreds whatever um, this stuff is exposed to the internet and if you have ever run your sort of mind around how this whole process works uh, what's the phrase from um, uh, Lincoln if I was going to chop down a tree I'd spend five hours sharpening my axe that's what we're talking about here is to be able to do this in a, to secure these things more effectively where you're removing them in a lot of instances from the internet now there's the other issue of how do I secure things when I don't have control of a device trying to access an application? That's a problem. Typically, you put your defenses up and hope that you've got things configured correctly so that bad stuff doesn't get to you. We've seen that that doesn't work. We've seen that there are vulnerabilities and ways around that. What if we flip that script a bit and we said there's a different way to do this? And we'll, we'll run through that as well. But let's just set the stage with some of the basics on the application side of this and the things that are worth noting as far as the, the scale of some of this problem. And again, this is not a college course. This is not all inclusive. There's a hundred different ways to skin this cat. Um, this is just to provide some, some boundaries, some grounding on the reality of it. So let's look at something like MySQL. Now MySQL database thingy been around since 95 ish, 96 ish, um, kind of hard for you to manage because once a database, thing is out there. People typically don't like to touch it. They're worried about taking it down. There's usually valuable data in there um, and it could cause a problem for the business, et cetera, or whoever's using that, that data in that database. Now, just doing some cursory stuff and I've edited out in these um, images here, anything to affiliate either the query that I'm running because it's pretty specific or the uh, actual instance from an IP address or company because I'm not trying to get myself in trouble. But if you run a specific query, you can find this stuff that talks where MySQL will come back and sort of vomit back its responses. This in the United States alone, and this was done today, which today is the 7th of July, 2022, um, 1,170,242 that are out there right now that are this, this way. Now, again, does that mean all 1 million of those are immediately pwnable? No, but out of a million, what if 5% are? And they're in the United States. How much data is behind those things? Problem, right? And again, it's a database thing. So taking it down is problematic. Removing it from service or production is probably a non-starter. Oh, and by the way, there's the risk of the data that's behind that thing uh, as well. So keep that in mind, a million plus um, just out there poking around today. Now, let's go look at something else. FTP is something people talk about all the time. And, and again, this is, we're, we're going at the big broad strokes here. So FTP, for those that don't know, file transfer protocol used to communicate and transfer files between computers, right? So think about that, transferring files between computers, um, network via the internet. Uh, users who've been at, granted access with FTP can receive and transfer files in the FTP protocol side of things. So Point being, uh, if you know what these things do, you can use FTP to get to something. You can pull files from something. FTP is a great way of moving things around a network. Now, again, this is stuff internet-wise, internet-wide rather, that you're able to get to with just some crafted stuff. And again, I've edited out the things that I don't want people to see. But here's a pretty good example in the United States, 15,000 with currently configured easy access, you could say, uh, FTP servers and you can see right there the login successful so that means log into it um, 15,000 of those now do all 15,000 of those have something super valuable behind it I don't know but again let's play percentages what if 10% of those 
right? And think of all the companies that are in the United States that might have something. And then the other thing to remember is that this could be an avenue to get to something else. So this FTP might be your access to get to something else if there's not good control around that. Problematic. Now let's also look at things like SSL certificates because this is a difficult thing to manage. Um, if you've ever been to a site where the SSL cert is bad, you'll notice that it's kind of probably not working correctly or whatever, but SSL certs are important. It's also a nightmare to manage. There are entire companies that are built just around SSL certificate management. This is a problem in the space. If you look in the US, United States right now, um, I went off and looked for invalid or no good SSL certificates that are out there that are doing their thing globally, 9 million plus. So 9 million plus things that aren't configured correctly, that hadn't been updated, etc. Now again, let's play the percentages. In the US, you can see right there, 2,873,842. How many of those have something that you could potentially work your way around or get to or leverage that for something else? And the value of SSL certificates, right? SSL helps protect the data. There's cryptographic things that happen there. Um, SSL helps an organization affirm their identity, their presence online so that you're not going to fake sites, those types of things. Your search ranking actually is almost dependent, you would say, on how good your SSL certificates are. In other words, Google will rank you higher if you have good SSL certs. That's valuable for the business. Um, PCI DSS requires that you have valid SSL certificates if you're doing transactions online. So there's a compliance thing there. And then lastly, SSL certificates can help you improve customer trust. This is because when you go look at a site, if something weird happens on the site because a certificate is not handled correctly, what happens? You go find another site, which might be a competitor. Oh, and by the way, a lot of times you'll go to a site and the little lock will be blipped out because there's something wrong with the cert. That's a problem. Uh, and you're going to go, well, I don't know if I trust this and maybe I don't send my money to this organization. So SSL certs are important, nightmare to manage, extremely difficult to manage at big, broad scale with all the things that we do on the internet. Uh, and you can see, again, we're talking millions of instances here. So there's got to be a better way to do this. And then lastly, you probably hear a lot of people talking about SSH. SSH is a pretty significant thing. I'll, re I'll give you the, the rundown on what this is here. So SSH Secure Shell or Secure Socket Shell is a network protocol that gives users, particularly, now this is important, system administrators, a secure way, secure way to access a computer over an unsecured network, which is good if you're the actual admin who's supposed to be doing the work which is bad if you're not the admin who's supposed to be getting to the thing or is getting to the thing because that's not how you want things to work. Um, SSH also refers to the suite of utilities that implement the protocol. SSH provides strong password authentication and PKI, mm -hmm, as well as encrypted data communications between two computers over an open uh, network such as the internet. So pretty valuable thing, pretty prolific. It's all over the place. Uh, last bit here, so in addition to providing that encryption, SSH is widely used by network administrators to manage systems and applications remotely, enabling them to log into another computer over a network, execute commands, and move files from one computer to another. So SSH is good for administrators. If you've ever been an administrator, you've used the heck out of SSH. SSH is a risk or threat for folks that don't manage SSH because if you know what you're doing, you go out there and look and you find SSH things and you begin poking and prodding and finding logins and et cetera, et cetera, I can be on the network as an administrator doing SSH stuff. Low hanging fruit, super easy to do. You wouldn't think that it is something that still works today, but it does. And just to show you again, that this is a thing, you know, here's a screenshot from doing a couple of pokes and prods and tickling some electrons on the internet. And there's the login to set up the accounts to go off and do the SSH things. One of them is for an electric organization which I think we would consider to be critical infrastructure, data, uh, excuse me, ICS, data, that type of thing. So the point being, there's a hundred different app, there's so many different applications, there's so many different things on the internet, but there's a lot of different ways that you can poke and prod at stuff to get them to give you the responses that you would use for that reconnaissance phase to begin to find accesses. This plays into the OWASP top 10, which you know application issues are prevalent and being able to do something differently to help secure this whole chain of events would be a game changer. Now, you also should ask the question, well, don't a lot of these organizations, especially when you're talking millions of them have 
web application firewalls in front of them? Probably. I would think a lot of them do. There's even open source WAFs. But obviously, something is not correct if you look at the market size and market dynamics and then you see these results that are available that the WAFs are not doing their job. And this is not just me thinking and saying this. This has been historically proven. There's lots of data to back this up. Go talk to an organization that's using a WAF. It'll be in monitor mode. What does that mean? Well, it's not actually defending anything. It's just taking notes. There's a better way to do this. Uh, I'm going to run through scenarios where we're kind of looking at the OWASP top 10 most, I would call it um, bad things, or that's kind of a dumb way to say it. Let's just call it most prolific uh, attack vectors. And then we're going to prove that if you flip the script a bit with this other approach, web application isolation, you can negate a lot of this risk and a lot of these threats. Does that mean everything all the time is a billion percent secure? Absolutely not. But what it means is that you can apply a different control, a different capability, not have to worry about device management and those types of things, and just have the apps do what they need to do and put policy that will actually take care of this. It's a different way of doing it. It's a different approach, but there's a heck of a lot of value in this. So bear with me. We're going to run through this and we're going to show, not just tell, that this is an actual uh, fix to the problem.